Hello everyone and welcome to the um, symposium about resting state functional connectivity, novel approaches and applications in healthy and clinical populations. So uh, my name is Marco Marino, I'm the chair of this session and I'm glad actually to have this chance, this opportunity of um, presenting this symposium and especially the speakers that will intervene that you can see in the list are Enrico Amico, uh, Camillo Porcaro, Giorgio Arcara, Jessica Samogin and Chiara Spironelli. So I will start this um, symposium with introducing myself, first of all, and then uh, uh, the, the speakers and a little bit what they will talk about. So uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow with FWO at the KU Leuven in Belgium. And the idea of this, uh, the topic of this symposium comes from the fact that since my doctoral studies, I've been working on resting state functional connectivity. Especially I was doing uh, EEG and fMRI combined in simultaneous recording. So I got uh, experience in developing advanced methods for this kind of applications. During the years uh, with working uh, only on healthy, uh, on healthy um, young volunteers, I moved into clinical populations also. And so this is why I had the chance also to meet other people that were doing similar things and from which I could learn also during my past. And the people that you are seeing that we talk are some of them. So um, I would like to introduce um, the first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Enrico Amico, who is uh, an Ambizione Fellow at the EPFL and the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And Enrico is uh, an expert in uh, functional connectivity, especially in uh, connectomics, and is the person who has developed this innovative approach called um, brain fingerprinting. And in this symposium, it will uh, show us how this method can be applied on magnetoencephalography data and uh, to see in which way this approach can uh, identify relevant uh, brain state. So um, from a behavioral point of view. So I would leave the floor to Enrico. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Marco. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation to this nice symposium. Um, let me share the slides on my talk first. Do you see the slides? Yes. yes. Perfect. So yeah, as Marco anticipated, my, my talk is going to be about brain fingerprinting and how to use brain fingerprint or to detect brain fingerprint in MAG data. Uh, before I get into that, I should start with some premises to set the grounds or the basic for who, whoever is not familiar with the concept of brain fingerprints or brain connectomics. So my main expertise, as, as Marco was already saying, is brain connectomics. So what is exactly brain connectomics? Is the use of network science to study the brain as a network. And what do you need? What do we, What do you need usually to, to to study the brain as a network? You need to define nodes and links from brain data. How do you usually do that? Well, you put a guy in an MRI scanner usually, uh, and as the guy is lying in the MRI scanner, you extract some information from his brain. The first information is the anatomical information. So his uh, anatomical configuration of cells and gyri that you can divide into patches or cortex using your favorite brain atlas um, and these are going to define the nodes of your net of your brain network for the guy's brain and then you need to define the links how do you define the links in a brain network well there are two possible ways either you map the anatomical fibers tracks connecting regions together using diffusion weighted imaging and photography modeling and you end up with actually counting the number of fibers or tracks connecting two regions together. And if you do this for all possible pair of brain regions, you end up with an object which is a matrix, an adjacency matrix, 
which is also a network and is giving you a summary of the structural architecture of the human's brain, of the guy's brain. And this is usually called structural connection or structural connectivity. Another way to define the links is to measure the fluctuation in the, in the case of fMRI of the blood, the blood fluctuation around the cortex as the cortex is being elicited from neuronal impulses. And what you end up with is time series for every one of the nodes that you have defined. And then you can measure any sort of statistical dependency between two uh, time series or two brain nodes in the guy's brain. Usually what people have been doing in the, in the past 20 years or so is being by computing Pearson correlation. So you compute Pearson correlation pairwise and you end up filling again this matrix below here that is giving you a summary of the functional activity of the guy's brain as he's lying in the MRI scanner. And it is usually called functional connectum or functional connectivity matrix. Well, everything that I just told you is basically my, what, what I do every day. So I start with some raw brain data and I go all the way to these nice matrices. And I, you know, I have nightmares about them and I have dreams about them and whatnot. What I'm gonna talk about in this talk is how do we use then this information? So the summary statistics that provided by functional connections to find fingerprints in the guy's brain. The concept, the concept of fingerprints, as we know, is actually related to the fingertips of, of a human hand that was actually discovered in the, you know, in the 16th century by, by an Italian um, physiologist whose name was Marcello Malpighi. And literally knew that nowadays we will be talking about the fingerprints in the brain. How, how did we get that far? So what, how did we do this, this jump to go from the fingertips of a human hand to actually try to find fingerprints in a, in a human brain? It's actually very simple as a concept, and it started with the seminal work by Emily Finn and colleagues in 2015, where they did the following experiment. They put, let's say, 10 subjects and subjects in the scanner twice. So in, um, in day one and day two. So they, they extracted the information from you know, these people's brain and were able to actually compute the functional connectum for each person. So in the end of the day, they end up with uh, two sets of connectum per subject, one in day one and one in day two. And then what did they do? They, they played what I usually call the guess who game. So imagine that you have like these two sets of connectum, they were randomly selecting one connectum in one deck and they were trying to guess the best matching connectum in the other set, which is very similar to this old game that, that we used to play as, as kids, which is the guess who game. So trying to find the features that were mostly similar between these two sets. And what was striking um, for them to find was that uh, with a very high uh, success rate, they were always able to find the same person. So even in this very synthetic, summary image that it's a matrix that represents the functional connectum, there are some elements that are unique to the individual. So the correlation pattern that you have in this matrices is unique to each one of us. And this was an interesting idea that just opened this field of brain fingerprinting. And I jumped into that because I was interested in, the, in this concept and I started to think about um, a way to, to mathematically infer and, and, and identify these, these uh, brain fingerprints from human brain. And then I thought, well, if you do this kind of guess who game for every, for every person in the data set, what you're actually doing, you are constructing another, another matrix, which, is, which I call identifiability matrix. And the identifiability matrix is not to be confused with the functional connectum, is it's an object that is encoding the similarity in, within your data set. It's, it's the best matching similarity of all the possible combination that you are doing when you're playing the guess who game. So it has number of subjects times number of subjects as dimension, number of subjects in the test day, in day one, and number of subjects in day two, 
and each little element in this matrix is, in, is encoding the similarity between different connections of different people. Specifically, if you look at the main diagonal, the main diagonal is what I call self-similarity, because the main diagonal is the connectum of the guy one in day one with the connectum of the guy, guy one in day two. So it's basically encoding the similarity of the guy within, within himself. And what about the off-diagonal elements? Well, the off-diagonal elements actually are encoding the information between the similarity, let's say, of guy one in day one with another guy in day two. So it's what I call I others or other similarity. And therefore, now the guessful game can be uh, played as an optimization game, an optimization framework, which you know in, uh, engineers really love about, which then you can use to, to develop machine learning algorithms or, or classification algorithms. And it's basically to make, in very simple terms, is to make the diagonal as bright, the main diagonal as, as to stand out as much as possible from the off-diagonal element. So you want to, the main diagonal, the self-similarity, to be as bright, or in this case, as yellow as possible with respect to the off-diagonal element. And this can be encoded into this metric that I call IDIF, which is the, the difference between the average value along the main diagonal and the average value uh, of the off-diagonal element. And this will give you a fingerprint score within your data set. Why am I telling you all this? Because this is what we're gonna use mainly to explore fingerprints in, in MAC data. So, so far fingerprints have been extensively mapped in fMRI data, but what about magnetoencephalography data? Can we find fingerprints within those kind of data? And Similarly to Emily Finn and colleagues, the pipeline is very simple. We're gonna use uh, human connection project data from, <clears throat> you know, in two different test and retest uh, sessions from around 100 unrelated subjects, um, more or less. And then, and then we're gonna extract functional connectums in session one, functional connectum in session two. And again, we're gonna play this guess who game as I was explaining to you to construct an identifiability matrix. And this will give, you, will give us like a, a score of the fingerprint within this MAG data set of the human connection project data. But another thing that we can do, we can go even more fine grain and we can say, okay, but okay, this is like related to the whole brain connection. But what, what if I want to go like edgewise? If, we want, if I want to see whether the link between region I and J is really good for fingerprinting or not. In that case, we also developed another method, which is based on intraclass correlation, which is a statistical measurement of how, how good you can differ subjects from each other. And in that case, we, without going into too much details, you're welcome to check out the reference below, but in, in a way we can go more deeper into the identifiability matrix score and check the link, the edgewise fingerprint. So whether there are links and therefore whether there are specific regions in the brain that are more um, prominent for fingerprinting, whether there are hubs for fingerprinting, if you will, and whether there are regions that are not really good for fingerprint, as you see in the, in the sketch depicted below. And that's what we basically did. So we started our analysis with this MAC data. And the first thing that we wanted to do, since I'm not new, I'm, I'm, I'm actually new in the MAC community, I wanted to check whether there, were, there was like a functional connection metric that was better than others for fingerprint. So we started evaluating with the Gansharin first author of this paper. We started to evaluate in the different metric that people are using in MEG. And there are, there, there are several. We, we decided to pick uh, six out of the several that people are using. And without, again, going into much detail here, people in MEG, in order to extract connectum, usually divide into amplitude-based measurements and phase-based measurements. So the amplitude-based measurements are basically similarly, similar to the Pearson correlation idea. And there, is, there are some that are correcting for the spatial leakage correction, which is an effect that you have when you do related to the source reconstruction in MEG data, and others who don't. So we picked two of them. 
And the second branch of metric that people use in MEG is, is related to phase coupling. In phase coupling, you have like, uh, for almost all of them, the spatial leak correction. And one of the most famous is, is what is called phase lag index, PLI. And all these other metrics that you see here are basically some sort of extension or approximation of PLI uh, to real data because PLI is very sensitive to, to noisy data. Like it's extremely sensitive to noisy data. So people have tried to extend or refine PLI to, to, to be better suited for, for, for real data. And uh, we started actually computing the identifiability matrix for each one of these metrics and, you know, every frequency band in the MEG data. And what we found was that we got very high fingerprints for most of these, of these metrics, but specifically for PLM, for, so, which is an extension of PLI that was proposed by Sorrentino and colleagues. And with a very high success rate, so similar to fMRI. So the success rate of the guess who game is around 95%. And in general, also the, some amplitude-based metrics like AC, here I, I'm showing you only the alpha and the beta band, but uh, this like is very similar also for the other three bands. We get also very high value um, for fingerprinting. Although, as you can see below, here in this histogram, the PLM is the one who wins for, uh, you know, for, for, most, for most of the frequency band, almost all the time, together with the AC for the success rate. Therefore, we wanted to explore, so the first question was, can we do, can we extract brain fingerprints from MEG data? Apparently we can, but what, what are they really telling us? So we wanted to know whether there is, is, is there is, some information encoded in these brain fingerprints that we can extract from, from MEG data. So we decided to dig deeper into this. And we wanted to look, as I was telling you about I, I did the link fingerprints and the nodal fingerprints. So we wanted to see whether there were regions that were hubs in fingerprinting and whether there were regions in the brain that were not really good for fingerprinting. And this map, here now is only for, for three specific metrics, the one that were best for identification. So PLM, amplitude envelope correlation, and amplitude envelope correlation corrected for spatial leakage, orthogonal lies. We see that most of the regions that are, especially in PLM and AC, most of the regions that are very good for fibrous printing are related to the visual system or occipital network together with some, you know, precuneus, cortices, and if you go to the beta band, also a little somatomotor, somatomotor areas, which was interesting because you see below the comparison with, uh, with the fMRI fingerprinting map. And in the fMRI fingerprinting map, what you have is that you have, again, the visual and the occipital areas very prominent in terms of hubs for fingerprinting, but you also have some more frontal pattern here in orange, which you don't have in, uh, in the MEG uh, pattern, which is telling you that, yes, there is some overlap between fMRI and MEG, but MEG is giving you another, is like a kind of a complementary information, which might be related also to the fact that in terms of neurophysiology, what you are measuring with MEG is, is quite different from fMRI. Uh, and, and this was an interesting concept because, you know, the signature of each one's brain can also depend on the data that you are using. So it can, you know, differ depending on whether you're using fMRI data or whether you use EG or MEG data. So just to summarize here, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the temporary answer that we have to, to our uh, first question, yes, we can extract brain fingerprint from MEG data, and yes, there is some complementary information to the fMRI fingerprints that people have been uh, largely addressed. But what about um, behavior? Even if, even if these regions are good for fingerprinting, is this fingerprinting map telling us anything about behavioral scores of the subject or cognitive scores of the subject? And what we did was to take exactly these maps that I was showing you before and to do a PLS, partial least square analysis, which is a sort of PCA um, 
compression um, with, with the cognitive scores that we had from the Human Connection Project dataset. And the scores were, just to name a few, episodic memory, executive function, fluid intelligence, language, processing speed, impulsivity, spatial orientation, sustained attention, verbal episodic memory, and working memory. Basically, we wanted to connect these scores with the brain maps, the fingerprinting maps that I was showing you before. And the interesting thing was that if you do that, you end up with a very high percentage of explained variance, specifically in the amplitude envelope correlation corrected for spatial leakage in most of the bands and also for PLM in most of the bands. In other words, MEG fingerprints are also related to behavioral scores of the subject, which was a very interesting result. And you know, here, if you're interested, this, we also did a, like a pie chart where you can see that, you know, how these, these cognitive scores are really distributed for brain maps. So, you know, the brain maps are mostly related to episodic memory and spatial orientation, of course, depending also on the frequency bands. It's a very dense uh, figure, if you will. You can spend hours, since you have the recordings, you can just stop and, and look at these together. But just to give you like a very, uh, quick picture, uh, these MAG fingerprints seem, seem really to be related to, to some behavioral uh, scores, so seem to have a behavioral significance. Okay, so, I mean, so far everything seems to be promising, right? We can extract brain fingerprints from, from MEG data. Uh, we were able to see that there are hubs of fingerprints that are some, some somewhat complementary to the fMRI information. And also we were able to find that there is some behavioral relevance of this brain fingerprint. So these brain fingerprints seem to be, seem to have some sort of meaning in MEG data. How do we take this to the next level? So how do we get to some uh, usefulness in, in the clinical domain for brain fingerprints? And this was the, the, basically the project that we started with Pierpaolo Sorrentino, the first author of the work, uh, was a postdoc in, in Marseille University, where we tried to take this fingerprint concept to, into a next level. How did we do, we do this? Basically, we extended the concept of identifiability matrix. Remember, the identifiability matrix is the matrix that I defined very early in the talk, where I was giving you the information on the self-similarity along the main diagonal and the other similarity along the off-diagonal. And it's basically this blue square here is the identifiability matrix that I was telling you about. But then what about, uh, what if we have um, a clinical population, let's say an Alzheimer population or a cognitive cognitively impaired population. This we can, we can still extract, you know, the identifiability matrix for this population, which will be the orange matrix here. However, the identifiability matrix in, an, in, a, in a clinical population, I really don't know whether I should trust it or not. I really don't know what the fingerprints of Alzheimer mean, unless I relate the similarity of these guys connect them to a benchmark or a baseline that I really know very well how it works, which is the healthy population scenario, which in this representation will be represented by these green uh, lines. In other words, we are extending the concept of fingerprints to what now we are calling clinical fingerprints, which is basically how similar I am as a patient to the benchmark to the group of controls. So it's not about like real fingerprints as before, it's about to define a distance, an individual distance of the guys connect them from the population of the healthy controls that I have. And why is this important and why do we need this? Well, because then once you have this score, in the end of the day, you get just one score, exactly like success rate or IDIF you get one score, which is telling you how far is the, the guy, the patient, from the control population in terms of connecting, of his function of connecting. And you can, as I'm showing you here, just to give you a few ideas, you can associate this score with clinical scores of the patient, and you can also use, use it for cross-validation or prediction of future scores, 
like we did in this paper. If you're interested, you can check it out. It just came out in your image. We, uh, we use to test this method that we, we, we developed, we use a population of healthy controls provided by Pierpaolo and of minimally uh, mild cognitive impaired subjects. So subjects that might go into dementia or Alzheimer's in later, but they're still unsure whether they will go, they will develop it or not. So it was a very, very peculiar uh, population. And what happened is if we again try to find and try to look at the maps, remember the fingerprinting maps that I was showing you before for the healthy population. What was really interesting in this data set was that if you look at the maps or the control group, the fingerprinting maps, they look really, you know, very, very good and in line with the ones that we, I was showing you before. Again, this is PLM like, like before. So nothing new here. It's actually confirming some of the results that we were having also in the Human Connection Project data set. But what was really striking to see was that uh, in the MCI group, in the mild cognitive impairment group, the fingerprints disappear. So in other words, it's, it's way harder to find, to detect and identify the, the patient from the set from the group of, of, from a clinical group, which uh, opens up a lot of possibility opportunities in, in, in trying also to, 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 uh, to hypothesize and speculate as to why this is happening. So what is happening to the brain signature of the guy undergoing neurodegeneration? This is still, you know, an open problem, but I just wanted to give you this as like a little, a teaser for this paper. If you're interested in, again, in knowing more, you can check the, the paper by Pep Paolo on, on online and, and you know, see for yourself. For interest of time, I'll just stop here. But this, again, it was very promising because it opens up like a new way of looking at fingerprints also in the, in the clinical domain. To conclude, I just give you like a very short introduction on how to look and explore uh, brain fingerprints with, with MEG data. What are the take home messages of this talk? Well, first of all, that it's possible to extract brain fingerprints from MEG data. And as I told you, MEG fingerprints provide complementary information with respect to fMRI fingerprints. There is some overlap, but it's not 100% uh, overlap. So the neurophysiological uh, features that you can extract from MEG data can be significantly different from the one that you can start with fMRI data. I hope I convince you that MEG brain fingerprints are behaviorally relevant due to the analysis that we perform at the Human Connection Project data. And also that MEG based clinical fingerprints can differentiate healthy and disease cohorts of an app, a new Pandora box of scenarios on how to use brain fingerprints in clinical population. However, there are some uh, notes that I would like to do at the end of this talk, which is always, always carefully assess all sources of confound. Because remember that brain fingerprints are not all and always related to something meaningful. Brain fingerprints can be related to the different FC metrics, to the spatial leakage effect, to motion artifacts, source reconstruction artifacts. So, it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship that every time you have a brain fingerprint means that you have something meaningful. You always need to carefully assess the sources of noise and artifacts, and then you can move on onto more behaviorally meaningful and clinically relevant question, research questions. I'm, I'm done with my talk. I just want to thank you my Ambizione grant, so that provided the funding for, for, this, for this work that I, told you about, which is you know, about fingerprint in the brain. And special thanks also go to the first authors and, uh, and the colleague, uh, the first author of the papers that I, that I introduced to you, which is Ekan Sarin, Dr. Pepal Sorrentino, and also a co-author in this work, that is Dr. Alessandro Griffa here at TPFL. And uh, I'll take uh, questions if there, there, there are any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Enrico, for this interesting talk and for uh,
presenting in such a short time such a promising approach also for a clinical uh, application. And so I now. Stop sharing, Marco? Yes. Yeah. You can stop sharing, yes. Okay. Thank you. And so concerning the, the questions, I uh, would like to say that there will be a, a question and answer session on uh, Thursday, the 9th of September. So uh, since there is not the occasion, we will be able to do it live uh, uh, during that time slot, uh, during the symposium, during the conference itself. So the next skipper, uh, speaker <laughs> instead will be uh, uh, Professor Camillo Porcaro. Um, Camillo is a senior researcher at the uh, National Research Council in Italy. And during his talk, he will talk about some studies in which he will show how um, the fractal dimension, a measure of complexity, can be used uh, to discriminate uh, resting state brain networks based on uh, their behavioral uh, role. So um, I give the floor to Camillo. Welcome to this talk on characterization of neural dynamic at rest by fractal dimension. The results shown in this uh, presentation are based on these two publications over here and to make clear all the results of this publication i try to introduce a little or in a more intuitive way the definition or the idea of fractals so let's start with the definition of fractals so in fractal geometry it is a subset of the euclidean geometry with a fractal dimension that strictly strictly exceeds its topological dimension Fractal often exhibits similar pattern at its increasingly smaller scale, a property called self-similarity. It is clear from this definition that fractal looks really complicated. But what I would like to do is instead to show you intuitively uh, the, the idea behind the, the fractal geometry. So in fractal geometry, a fractal dimension is a ratio providing a statistical index of complexity. So fractal dimension is able to measure the complexity of an object. So let's start with a simple object and so on. And so on, we'll see the, how we can estimate the fractal dimension in more complex ob objects. So let's start with a segment. So one, a one dimensional object. So we have, segment A and segment B. So if we want to measure segment B from segment A, we can use a scale factor K. And then we can say that segment B is equal to A by the K factor. So if the segment A is equal to two and the scale factor is half of the segment A, we have that B is equal A by K, then is equal by one. So this show the relationship that length <coughs> is equal sides by k factor power by one. If we move to a two-dimensional object, for example, a triangle, it is clear that the area of the triangle can be calculated by the Euclidean geometry by area A equal B by H, B by H divided by two. So if we want to measure the area of the triangle uh, B <coughs> using a k factor, so a scaling factor, uh, we can use the property that just we learned above. So multiply the two segments, so B and H, by the factor, the scale factor k. Then we have that B is equal to k square B by H divided by two. But B by H divided by two, we say that this area A. Then we have that the area B is equal by A by K power by two. So the relationship is areas or 2D dimension object is equal to sides by K scale factor power by two. To make the long story short, we say that for a three dimensional object, we have the volume is equal to sides by the key factor power by three. 
So we found the relationship one dimensional object, k, k factor power by one, two dimensional object, k factor power by two, a three dimensional object, k factor power by three. So make a little bit more complicated the idea of this relationship. So if we want to measure the area of the triangle A, but without the triangle in the middle, so the triangle four, we can make still using the uh, Euclidean geometry. But let's see if we use this step and iterate this step infinite time, what we get is something like this. We got the Sierpinski triangle. So as you can see now, it's a little bit more complicated to measure the area of the, the, the Sierpinski triangle, even if we use the scale factor, maybe we can make it more easy. For example, which is the area of the triangle B? So we learn as from before, from above, that the area of an object B is equal to the area of the object A by the scale factor powered by two, if it is a two, uh, two D object, Let's see that D for now is an unknown and we live like, like a D. But also since the triangle B is self-similar to triangle A, we have that A is equal three times B. So if we make some algebra over here, we have that two power D is equal to three. Then from this equation, we'll see that the Sierpinski triangle is not a, a triangle with dimension equal to one because we will have two equal to three, that is impossible. It's not a um, dimension equal to two because we have four equal to three, that is impossible. So which is the dimension of this triangle? The dimension of this triangle, if we move to the logarithms, is something like d logarithm by two equal logarithm by three. Then d is something like 1.585. So this is the dimension of the triangle, of the Sierpinski triangle. So the Sierpinski triangle is a object that is a dimension, a fractal dimension, because it's not an integer uh, object, is equal one by 0.585. So everything that we learned until now on the geometry, on the fractal geometry, we can translate in time series uh, uh, analysis or fractal time series. And thanks to the Iguchi uh, algorithm that uh, developed this algorithm that is able to estimate the fractal dimension in the time domain, we can have intuitively two, uh, upper, two, two level of the fractal dimension in time series. One that is the upper bound and the other is the lower bound. The upper bound is through the um, random noise. So for a random noise time series, the fractal dimension estimate, estimates is equal to two. So the upper bound. Instead for a ramp time series, the fractal dimension is equal to one. So the lower bound, because the fractal dimension for a time series is always between one and two. So this means that for a no memory process, we have high complexity and for a full memory, process, we have lower complexity. All the other time series, and then also the uh, neurophysiological or neurophysiological time series are in between them. So we can simulate a Weinstrass cosine, for example, that is uh, that has a fractal dimension equal to 1.5. So now can be the question why we need another um, index that is able to measure the electrophysiological data. Mainly uh, because uh, uh, if we go through this uh, two paper, famous paper, we can see that um, electrical recordings from many brain regions at multiple spatial scales exhibit neural oscill oscillation that are not sinusoidal. Then this is a, pre a first, uh, uh, first, uh, first uh, let's say, uh, hypothesis that we have to put on the electrophysiological data if we want to use power spectrum density, for example, to characterize uh, electrophysiological data. And 
Also because the, more, uh, the most dangerous phrase we can say is that we have always done it in this way and then we follow to do the, the thing as we did. So based on that, and I try to, uh, to understand that more index is always good to have, we can estimate the fractal dimension on resting state networks. And we, in particular, we estimate eight resting state networks from electro electroencephalography reportings. Each resting state networks is characterized by one time series. So we want to characterize the complexity of this time series that, char that characterize the uh, resting state network. To do so, we approach in the, uh, with a linear way, so the traditional way that we is the power spectrum density. And we got that for each band, we have delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma band. We have the characterization of the, each resting state networks. As well, we did for the fractal dimension. So we can see from these two indexes that each resting state network is well characterized by the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma power, but also from the complexity index through the fractal, estimated by fractal dimension. So to make this more data-driven, we use a hierarchical clustering. And we use the feature of delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma to make the clusterization through the hierarchical cluster and the fractal dimension. What we got, we got that for each band, we have a characterization in a power spectrum of each resting state network, and in particular for the gamma band, we found that the, the clusterization divided the eight, class, the eight resting state network in two clusters. These two clusters are well characterized from the uh, physiological point of view, because the first cluster is based on default mode network, language network, and all the cognitive networks. Instead, the second cluster is more characterized by perceptual networks, so visual, auditory, and sensory motor network. As well, we got the same results through the fractal dimension. But in this particular case, we did, we did not choose a specific band, but we used the full uh, recordings. So all the, the frequency bands. And as well, we have these two clusters that are characterized by a cognitive and perceptual. In this particular case, we also compare the entropy, that is another measure of complexity. But in this case, the entropy fail to characterize these two clusters. The same thing we got at the single subject level. In this particular, in this particular case, in this figure, we can show that mainly uh, also at the single subject level, the um, high cognitive network are characterized by lower frequency band. Instead, the uh, perceptual network are more characterized by high frequency band, so beta and gamma. At the same time, the cognitive network has lower complexity. Instead, the perceptual network have higher complexity. The same results, we, are, we were, were able to find in a recording done in the MRI environment. In this particular case, we use 52 right-handed volunteers. And comparing what we found in the EEG data from the fMRI data, we found exactly the same results. For the resting state network, we gave this uh, complexity measure as a feature to the hierarchical cluster. And the hierarchical cluster uh, create two main cluster, the first cluster and the second cluster. So the first cluster is more um, high, com high cognitive. Instead, the second cluster is more perceptive. So as a take home message, we can say that the recognition that physiological time series contain hidden information that might be captured by nonlinear meters such as fractal time series might provide crucially crucially and so far overlooked physiological information. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you Camillo for your uh, interesting talk and for uh, suggesting also these uh, good reads uh, to check better for uh, uh, this topic. And for going on, the, the next speaker 
would be uh, Dr. Giorgio Arcara. And so uh, Giorgio is senior researcher at the IRX Research Hospital in Venice, Italy. And during his talk, uh, he will uh, talk about a novel approach that allows decomposing the EEG signal in a periodic and aperiodic component. And we see how the integration of this different information has uh, a behavioral relevance in defining specifically the cognitive reserve in uh, healthy uh, old adults. So, uh, Thanks, Giorgio, also for joining us. So the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Giorgio Arcara, and today my talk will be on uh, nonlinear relationships between cognitive and brain reserve. So let's start with the definition of cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve is a concept that has been introduced to explain individual differences in uh, susceptibility to cognitive impairment that is related to age uh, deterioration or pathology related deterioration like Alzheimer's disease. Shortly, people with uh, high cognitive reserve would be more protected against uh, the negative effect of brain pathology or brain degeneration in general. On the other side, the people with uh, uh, low cognitive reserve would be highly uh, um, or more affected. In general, the concept, concept of cognitive reserve is associated with that of the accumulation. The reserve is something that you accumulate during your life thanks to uh, stimulating intellectually, um, intellectually stimulating life experiences as uh, the schooling, uh, so education in general, walking activities or leisure activities. Another related concept is that of brain reserve. Uh, actually, the concept of brain and cognitive reserve are mostly overlapped and maybe the stress is just a bit different with the, uh, in the brain reserve, the, the, the stress is more on the physical substrate of this protection against uh, the brain uh, decline associated with uh, age-related degeneration or pathology-related degeneration. So, in the context of the this presentation I decided not to use brain reserve but rather to use brain status as an in, uh, in a collection of indicators that are associated with the brain integrity like brain volume or to um, in general to brain functioning like measures from EEG. Uh, a couple more slides on uh, definitions which are crucial. In uh, this paper, I will use uh, some measures of cognitive reserve. And it's important to stress that here I indicate uh, some measures that are proxies of the, and an estimate of the initial reserve. And the two most commonly used are education, so the schooling, which is uh, uh, known to be associated to higher cognitive reserve, the higher the education, the higher the cognitive reserve in later life, and also uh, the vocabulary test. The scored vocabulary tests are considered proxies uh, of crystallized intelligence, are not uh, you, typically the, much influenced by the ongoing brain pathology, and they uh, are considered to be also measures or proxies of cognitive reserve. On the other side, when we will talk about measures of brain status, uh, this could be in some way uh, considered as an estimate of the residual brain reserve which allows us to track uh, uh, brain uh, deterioration. And uh, the two I will focus on are the brain volume, which, you, which is of course associated with, uh, with um, the brain atrophy, which, which is an indicator of brain degeneration, and also the EG power. Because there are many, many studies showing that as the age increases, there are changes in the power um, spectral properties of the EEG signal. In particular, for example, uh, there is a decrease in the power of alpha, uh, which is associated with age-related deterioration and worse performance. In the context of the present paper, we decided to uh, complicate a bit uh, more the things uh, and we use uh, a more advanced method, uh, which is the fitting oscillations and 1 over f. Uh, which is a, an analytical method to uh, investigate power spectrum density. Uh, thanks to this method, uh, um, we basically fit the overall trend of the power spectrum, which is here represented, with the, uh, in two separate parts, the aperiodic component and the periodic component. 
So, uh, I don't have much time to explain how this method works, but it briefly uh, I will try to explain. When you analyze with the more traditional methods uh, the power spectrum and some property, for example, the peak in alpha, typically uh, you just take the raw value of the peak in alpha, like this one, which will be like high like this from the, the bottom to the top. However, you can see that there is another trend which is superimposed with the, with the peak itself, which is the, uh, which typically uh, follows an exponential function. And this, uh, and so an increase or a decrease in, uh, uh, in alpha, just to take alpha as example, could reflect not a, a real change in alpha oscillations, but rather a change in this overall curve. So this FOOF method basically allows to fit separately the two aspects, the aperiodic component, which is this one, and the periodic component, which is actually associated with peak, highlighted in green here. And to be more precise, when you fit the upper periodic component, typically you extract two separate parameters, uh, which are exponent and offset. Why are these important? Uh, a recent paper by Donog and colleague that who um, also uh, showed and shared the code to, to make this analysis that uh, in aging is associated with uh, not only decrease in alpha power but also a change in the offset and in the exponent in particular uh, a reduction in both uh, with the change in the exponent indicated a flatter power spectrum as compared to younger adults in older adults and uh, so this seems to be an, a, a sign of uh, age related changes but also it seems to correlate with working memory performance so it could be also a good indicator or of cognitive uh, status uh, to complicate more things uh, we decided to analyze uh, this data the data on cognitive reserve on brain status and on cognitive performance using uh, um, specific models uh, that allow to model complex non-linearity which are GAMS GAMS are, uh, or generalized additive models are an extension of generally linear model in which the relationship between predictors and the outcome variable is modeled as a generic function which is made up basically by uh, the superimposition of polynomials or other basis functions. And in this way, GAM, uh, basically it's able, uh, GAMS are able to, in a bottom-up fashion, model nonlinearities. And why we are so focused on nonlinearities? Because on previous studies using only behavioral um, variables, we um, showed that, uh, we, with uh, my research group, we showed that there could be complex nonlinear interaction with cognitive reserve. And then this appears to be also the case when introducing some brain volume. So basically, the compensatory effect of cognitive reserve could be um, relevant only in some specific case. And this basically is an interaction that should mob the, in an appropriate way. So uh, for the um, present study, we uh, used uh, this uh, data set, which is the Lemon data set uh, um, that includes uh, many young adults and older adults participants, include the MRI and the EG data and several variables, cognitive variables and variables that can be used as proxy of cognitive reserve. And of course, we focused on resting state eyes closed data. So my aim is to show you how this, uh, um, again, this resting state data, in this case on EG, could be uh, useful to investigate these complex relationships between cognitive reserve and brain status. Concerning the data preprocessing, of course, we follow different uh, pipeline for the structural MRI, for the EG data. But uh, what I wanted to stress here is that for the uh, FOOF analysis, so to extract these aperiodic components and periodic components, we focused on two parietal ROIs from the brain at home atlas. And this is a sort of limitation and uh, because we just focused and narrowed our scope for this analysis in this, this just this small uh, aspect. And, uh, and, and, and this is why also this results should be considered as preliminary. Concerning the data analysis, we made a preliminary data analysis comparing young and uh, old adults, but the core data analysis was on cognitive reserve, which was that was restricted to uh, old adults, in which actually we expect some compensatory effect of cognitive reserve. So we used uh, some measures of uh, cognitive reserve, education and vocabulary test, and also some brain status measures, which are the ones that I uh, described before. 
and we wanted to investigate how the interaction between these could influence the cognitive status measures, which were a, an executive function test, so on working memory, which is the TAP, and the California Velvar Learning Test, which is a test on memory and recall. So let's go uh, to the results, and first of all, let's see what, what were the main results on uh, this preliminary analysis, which showed the trend that we expected. So a decreased total brain volume in older adults as compared to young adults, but more importantly, we replicated the results by Danok, in which uh, both the alpha power, the exponent, and the offset were reduced in older adults as compared to uh, older adults. However, while half a power, we had just a, uh, an, a non-significant actual effect, but approximating significance, we, we, were, we had much stronger effect for the exponent and the offset. So highlighting the importance of considering this when uh, you want to investigate age-related changes in power. But uh, what about the, this pon uh, potentially complex interplay between cognitive and brain reserve that we hypothesized? Uh, in the following slide, I will report the main results for the CAMs, for the generalized additive models. And uh, I want to stress again that these are rare restricted on older adults. However, before running this, we also run that some more traditional linear models and uh, to see if uh, maybe a linear model could explain. But here, we just found some, uh, an effect of total brain volume with, uh, in, with the California verbal learning test with a paradoxical negative effect. So the higher the brain volume, the worse the performance. And this was probably due to a missing collider uh, rather to, to be a spurious effect because basically it contradicts most of the literature. The results were much, much more consistent with the GAM, uh, in which uh, 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 I will show only the effect of exponent and not of offset and of alpha power because they were highly correlated all with each other and this led to problem with model fit and uh, um, this should also be considered as a limitation of the, the study. So, uh, the first important uh, result is this one. And this plot basically showed the nonlinear interaction between total brain volume and the vocabulary test. This is a measure of brain status, this is a measure of cognitive reserve. So how to interpret this plot? Basically, what you can see here is that, uh, um, um, well, colors towards blue indicates lower values, which is a better performance because these are reaction times. So the faster reaction times are observed here for a combination of high brain volume and high cognitive reserve. On the other side, the worst values were towards this part of the plot in which you have low brain volume. So what can you see here? It seems that there is a difference effect of the interaction between the cognitive reserve and brain status. While for low value of cognitive reserve, this line is basically here, the, the values here are almost always the same, so this is a, should be considered almost as a flat line. So if you have a low cognitive reserve, no matter your brain volume, your performance will be almost like this. Instead, when you have cognitive high values of cognitive reserve, the higher the brain volume, the best the performance. So this is the, exactly the kind of interaction we were looking for and that we were able to um, detect with GAM. Uh, another result we obtained is for the exponent, and the, in the exponent uh, we found this. So the real score was the lower value of education in this sample, and the gymnasium was the higher value of the education. And while we see an almost flat line for the real score, which means that no matter the value of the exponent, the expected reaction times are always almost the same. For the gymnasium value, so the higher level of education, the higher cognitive reserve, as the exponent increases, and uh, remember, higher exponent is associated also uh, to um, being younger in general. Young adults have higher exponent levels as compared to uh, older adults. So you can see a decrease in the reaction times, which means better performance. We obtain these uh, results only for one ROI and only uh, well, for one, one ROI and only for the uh, working memory test. No, no significant results were found for the for the California verbal learning test. 
So uh, before concluding, I want to stress that, that this study that I'm going, I presented today is more like uh, um, an explanation of a potential method to investigate the, the, the interaction, complex interactions, and how uh, resting state EG data in combination to other brain status data like total brain volume can be used together to investigate some crucial concepts like the interaction between cognitive reserve and brain status. And, uh, um, but of course, these are preliminary results because I used only two parcels. There were some overlaps between EG measures, so I could not fully investigate them. And also the flexibility of GAMS uh, lead to many analytical paths and it's difficult to, um, to establish if I use a, a proper one. So, in conclusion, uh, brain deterioration as assessed with structural brain measures can have a different impact of cognitive function and these can depend on cognitive reserve as a measure with the, with the proxies that we included. And uh, in general, I think that I hope that I showed that the study of a complex concept like cognitive reserve and how these may interact with the deterioration may benefit with the use of an advanced analytical methods like generalized additive models. Before concluding, I want to show the faces of um, all people working on this project and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Giorgio. That was a really amazing uh, topic to address, and I really enjoyed your uh, your presentation. And yeah, I I really think this is uh, something uh, a topic that will find a very much uh, application uh, and interest in the uh, coming uh, future. Okay, and so now I would like to introduce the next. Speaker, who is Dr. Jessica Samogin, uh, who I'm actually very happy to introduce because Jessica, uh, she's a colleague of mine in uh, Leuven and we've been working uh, together for uh, part of my doctorate also and her doctorate. And so I'm very happy that uh, she accepted also this invitation. And uh, so she will talk about this uh, new project that she's addressing in which uh, we'll uh, uh, apply a seed-based approach for identity EG analysis uh, to check for differences in uh, healthy and young, um, healthy young and healthy old uh, participants, so to check for uh, age-related differences. So uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, please go on. You can share your... Thank you, Marco. Thank you for your presentation, introduction. Okay, so as Marco said, I'm gonna talk about EEG based resting state functional connectivity in older adults and it's linked to motor performance. Let's start with what we measure, which is called brain functional connectivity, defined as the statistical dependence between the activity generated in different cortical regions. There are uh, several approaches and methods as uh, the other presenters said before to calculate functional connectivity. In this study, we uh, used a seed-based approach, which relies on the definition of specific cortical regions, which activity is reconstructed as, at source level, activity over time. And with that, we um, evaluated the similarity of the power envelopes of these 10 courses, meaning the similarity between the two green um, lines on the figure from Engel et al. This is a commonly used method in, uh, um, for calculating functional connectivity from fMRI data as well as uh, uh, MAC data and EEG data. The task that we used for uh, our, our experiment is actually the only task that's not usually considered as such and is the resting state, also known as my wandering condition. Participants are relaxed, sitting usually in front of a screen, and they are required to not think at anything in particular, just to fixate across uh, presented on the screen in order to make sure they don't, they don't fall asleep. This could be considered the baseline condition of the um, awake brain. So there are no stimuli that 
activate anything, any region in particular. Over the past years, many studies used functional magnetic resonance imaging to uh, measure brain activity during resting states. And more recently, MAG and EEG, magneto and electroencephalography, have been used as well. Considering the main features or the most important features of these two categories of uh, techniques, imaging techniques, when it comes to temporal resolution and partially also spatial resolution, EEG is preferred over uh, fMRI. Because particularly for the temporal resolution, it allows to measure um, signals at the millisecond um, time, order of time. Also, electroencephalography is a direct measure of brain activity, of the electrophysiological activity of neural populations. And is all, and also uh, consists in a small and portable equipment, which is definitely an advantage when it comes to patients or children or even measuring um, brain activity while performing more complicated tasks as walking, running, or cycling. So for these reasons, we um, decided to use EEG data, particularly high-density EEG um, data, data sets, um, which used one more, uh, 128 electrodes that allows a better coverage of the scalp. When performing uh, functional connectivity analysis, what we usually retrieve, our, or, well, our results are usually related to resting state networks, which are the cortical regions that are frequently active in response to the same stimulus. These networks are presented with the connectivity maps and also connectivity matrices, as seen in, other, um, in the previous talks. On the left side, there are the connectivity maps of some of the most uh, known networks obtained from fMRI data, whereas on the right side, the, uh, there are connectivity maps uh, obtained from high-density EEG data. And as you can see, the correspondence between, um, the similarity between corresponding maps is remarkable. So for this reason, Marino et al. is one of the papers that used EEG for, uh, as an imaging technique, brain imaging technique. Um, for these reasons, we, we decided to use um, EEG and trust EEG results for this particular study. These maps were obtained on healthy young subjects. But what about older people, where we know that the aging if affects uh, our brain from a functional, structural, and biochemical point of view. And in particular, um, several, again, fMRI studies has sh have shown that there are changes in the functional connections within and between specific brain networks, and that these changes are related to both motor and cognitive uh, functions, and particularly deficits. So, when it comes to the aging brain, the most investigated hypothesis is called the de-differentiation hypothesis, which states what follows. So first, there is a decrease in, function, in the functional specialization of brain networks. And second, there is an increase in connectivity between networks, meaning that networks that in young adults would be able to work independently in older adults are more likely to interact to obtain the, to achieve the same kind of goal. Such effect is network dependent, uh, meaning that it's not always connectivity, a higher connectivity in older adults for all the networks. For some networks, there's connectivity is lower. Uh, and it's also, and it, it also depends, um, it, it relates to the motor performance of the same subjects. Again, these results, these findings were obtained mostly using fMRI. However, fMRI is, doesn't measure directly the brain activity. It's a mediated measure. So what we wanted to test is first if um, such findings have an electrophysiological basis. And if so, we should be able to obtain from our EEG data the same kind of results uh, supporting the de-differentiation hypothesis. And also, thanks to the high temporal resolution of EEG data, 
we could be able, we should be able to um, define the frequency properties of such age-induced modulations in functional connectivity. Secondly, uh, regarding connectivity and motor performance, we want to see, we wanted to see if there's a connection or relation between connectivity at rest as obtained from EG data and the bimanual ability, bimanual coordination ability of the same participants. In particular, we would expect such a relation to involve uh, the motor network, since we are talking about a motor task, and connectivity in beta band, because again, beta band is the uh, frequency band usually associated with the motor network and motor tasks. To do so, we uh, did re uh, record resting state EEG, but we also asked our participants to perform a bimanual coordination task, which consisted in uh, the rotation of the two dials, sim uh, asymmetric and synchronous rotation, that corresponding to the movement of the red dots presented on a screen in front of them. Such red dot was supposed to follow the white dot on, along the uh, blue line. Young and older adults uh, underwent first the EEG residency session and then uh, they performed the task several times without visual feedback, meaning they did not see the red dot, but just the white dot. So with the EEG data, we, um, it was AC based analysis. So we defined 21 seeds distributed over the cortex belonging to six uh, resting state networks. And we calculated connectivity within each network. So between the nodes belonging to the same network and connectivity between networks. Again, between nodes belonging to the different networks. And the first, uh, question that we had is whether connectivity within the different networks was always higher than connectivity between each network and the others, always in terms of frequencies and not time. So if for all the frequency bands within network connectivity was always higher than between, which is what we would expect from fMRI connectivity matrices. In order to understand the following results, um, we need, I want to show, to explain how to read these connectivity matrices. So values on the diagonal represent uh, the within network connectivity. So the average connectivity between networks, between nodes of the same network. Whereas on the upper and lower triangular matrices, we have connectivity uh, between nodes of pairs of networks. So the between network connectivity. Going back to our uh, deep differentiation hypothesis, uh, old and uh, young adults, we expect to see if the, the hypothesis is correct, um, a higher connectivity between networks and lower connectivity within the networks, so lower segregation. However, when calculating the connectivity matrices for the two, groups of uh, participants, we found that the asterisks and diamonds, which represent the conditions for which connectivity within the network is significantly higher than connectivity between that particular network and all the others, those asterisks are basically in the same position, so in the same frequency for the corresponding networks, with the exception of the default mode network, which means that even for older adults, within network connectivity is still higher than between network connectivity in uh, a similar way than that is for younger people, meaning that funct functional segregation is preserved. However, when comparing the matrices on the left side with the corresponding one on the right side, so connectivity of young and older adults, we found this where the blue squares represent higher connectivity in older adults and the red squares represent higher connectivity in the younger adults. And as you can see, older adults are more likely to have significantly higher connectivity between networks, which, whereas the opposite is true for younger adults. 
this effect is not only frequency dependent, so for example, in general, in Delta, older adults have stronger connectivity, uh, whereas in Alpha, the younger adults show stronger uh, functional connections. It, this effect is also network dependent, so it's not true for all the networks in all the frequency bands or every, any um, network pair. And this supports the differentiation hypothesis. When uh, analyzing the relation between connectivity at rest and motor performance, and in particular connectivity involving the motor network and the level of bimanual coordination, we found that only for the other adults and only in beta bands, there is a significant positive correlation between connectivity and motor performance. In particular, expanding that result for the beta band to all the networks, the six networks we use we see there, that there is an interesting pattern of positive correlations between task relevant networks as the attention networks and the motor network and the default mode network, which is expected because we are looking at resting state data, not EEG acquired during the task. Um, a, a, correlate, a pattern of correlations, positive correlations again, which suggests that the higher the the functional con the stronger the functional connections between these networks, the better the motor performance. So the, the better uh, the, the performance of the bimanual coordination task. So to uh, summarize, going back to our original hypothesis, we can say that yes, there is an electrophysiological basis to the uh, functional, modula functional modulations previously found in fMRI data, and in particular, that uh, the, the differentiation hypothesis can be proved uh, also with EEG data. So there is higher between natural connectivity in older adults. However, this is a particularly frequency-specific um, effect. Indeed, older adults have lower connectivity in alpha and gamma band in general, and higher connectivity in delta and theta bands. As for the <clears throat> correlation between resting state connectivity and motor performance, again, there is such a correlation which involves particularly task relevant networks, motor and attention in beta band, which is again a frequency band related to the task, to, to a motor task, and the higher the connectivity the better the bimanual coordination. And that was it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, this topic, and I'm very happy to see how the um, methods somehow that uh, are developed in uh, our lab uh, are finally getting into uh, application. And so for, um, yeah, also for this aging study. So that's that's great. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Okay, and um, so now we got into the final speaker uh, with um, Professor Chiara Spironelli from the University of Padua in Italy. And she will talk about some uh, um, application of uh, functional connectivity studies on clinical population, as specifically on um, patients with bipolar disorders and she will introduce uh, an approach in which uh, standard functional conductivity uh, techniques will be integrated on the studying of functional oscillations of fMRI data and so yeah I'm looking forward for this talk and uh, so please the floor is yours. Thank you Marco. Can you see now my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mark, for the organization of this symposium on a so important topic as the resting state functional connectivity offers a number of opportunity to increase our knowledge on the brain functioning on both health individuals as well as in clinical populations, including neurological and psychiatric 
patients. And also thank you for inviting me to share the result of a resting state fMRI study that was carried out six or seven years ago, but was analyzed only recently, applying the pipeline developed under the supervision of Professor Dante Mantini. So it's a pleasure to discuss with you all the results of this research and I will disclosing the full moneta corneoptimic bipolar patient and healthy control, a combined approach to resting state fMRI data. Uh, the current resting state network approach. Um, Okay, the current um, resting state network approach has a quite recent history that formally uh, began in 2007 when Mantini and colleague proposed a new approach uh, aimed at studying the spontaneous brain networks involved in resting state condition. In particular, uh, focus on the investigation of the relationship between hemodynamic and electrical brain oscillation, applying a data driven approach to uh, simultaneously acquire EEG and fMRI data, showing six different resting state networks associated with different functions, ranging from sensory network as well as the uh, visual processing network to more cognitive networks, including, for example, the dorsal attention, the language network, the auditory network, and so on. Starting from the publication of this article, the resting state network study has represented a benchmark for the following investigation. Um, for both uh, has to uh, study uh, as the adult and uh, maybe also to foresee what happens at, uh, uh, during the task, a task execution in healthy adults, but also in a clinical population to predict uh, what could happen after a stroke event. And among all of this network, uh, the default mode network has been the most studied so far. And in this review, published in 2008, focused on past studies carried out on clinical population and discussed and discussing the uh, cognitive disorder associated to default mode network alteration mm, uh, give us an idea of the wide, uh, um, the wide amount of uh, clinical application associated to the study of the formal network in particular. And probably the functional anatomy of the network in detail reveals that it has been best understood as multiple interacting subsystem. In particular, the medial temporal lobe subsystem providing information from prior experiences from uh, the form, uh, the memories and the association that are the building blocks of the mental simulation. On the contrary, the medial prefrontal subsystem facilitates the flexible use of this information during the construction of self-relevant mental simulation. And these two subsystems converge on important hub of integration, including the posterior cingulate cortex that uh, have applied awareness in this network. Mm. As a final remark on the full mode network, in a recent paper, Mantini and colleague revealed that this network is well represented not only in humans, but also in monkeys associated brain regions. Here we can easily recognize the topographical representation of the full mode network in the monkey associated, however, with different functional signatures. According to the redeployment theory, pre-existing networks has been repurposed during evolution to carry out new function. For all this reason, and considering that the resting state measurement have no cognitive demands instead of psychological experiments that include task execution, cognitively impaired person can also be measured easily using uh, this approach. And research using resting state and the default mode in particular has the potential to be um, applied in a clinical context. Uh, here you can see a non-exhaustive list of research with resting state use applied in the assessment of many different um, disease and mental disorder, including Alzheimer's disease, autism spectrum disorders, schizophrenia, depression, attention, 
um, deficit hyperactivity disorder, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia nervosa, and so on. And you can see how the resting state connectivity appear altered in all this disorder. So the present research uh, joined together the traditional independent component analysis, the ICA, a data-driven method to identify temporally coherent spatial patterns of the bold signal, and an alternative approach, fractional amplitude of low frequency fluctuation that focus on the spectral feature, feature associated with a specific network. Here, we therefore provide complementary analysis by combining the assessment of the food mode network special pattern with the traditional ICA, the food mode network spectral power derived from the DNMN time series using the five alternative approach that focus on the spectral feature associated with this network. These analyses were carried out uh, on a group of euthymic patients suffering from bipolar disorder and in a group of healthy control with similar sociodemographical characteristic. More in detail, the main goal of the present study was to investigate whether euthymic bipolar patients show a deformal net alteration in the spatial representation of the network and whether such alteration could represent a marker for uh, helpful for the bipolar disorder diagnosis. This latter index could complement the full mode, default mode network conventional connectivity analysis uh, representing the spectral analysis of the default mode network amplitude fluctuation in both uh, group of participants, but also offering an innovative view particularly suited uh, to the study of complex psychiatric disease, such as uh, in the patient suffering from bipolar disorder in an eutemic state. Why eutemia? Because eutemia refers to a mental state or mood that is neither manic or depressive, but yet distinguishable from the state of healthy people. So it's a very uh, challenged condition, uh, difficult to, um, to study uh, applying the traditional approach. In our study, we therefore enroll 18 bipolar disorder in an eutemic phase that satisfy the eligibility criteria according to the young mania rating scale, uh, which in a manic score below eight, and 16 healthy adults with no psychiatric, no neurological, neither psychiatric nor neurological uh, deficit. Uh, we ask our participants to complete a resting state MRI scan with keeping the eyes open for uh, a total length of eight minutes. And uh, with respect to fMRI data analysis, we apply the ICA as well as the FAF analysis, focusing on the default mode network time series for uh, bipolar disorder and healthy participants. Okay, here you can see the topographical representation of the group uh, DMN special maps and consistent with previous results, for example, Mantini et al. 2007-2013, we can recognize, uh, clearly recognize uh, the uh, anterior and posterior cingulate cartridges, as well as the left and the right angular gyri, bilaterally distributed. And the same pattern appear clear uh, for the uh, patient group. So uh, this is a, um, a result in line with past research on bipolar disorder. Uh, we also carry out a statistical analysis, uh, the t-test on uh, looking for between group differences, and we found no evidence of uh, between group differences in the spatial correspondence of the formal network regions. Concerning, however, the normalized FALF analysis, compared to healthy control depicted with the blue line, the bipolar patient, red line, uh, show altered amplitude of uh, the full mode network correlated fluctuation in three, um, in three uh, temporal interval, the one associated to this black dot. In the 0.015 to 0.20 Hz, corresponding to this yellow box, 
uh, between the 0.035 uh, 0.040 hertz, uh, the green box, uh, and in the 0 0.080, 0.080, uh, 0.085 hertz band, uh, the light blue uh, box. Uh, this band corresponds to a uh, different frequency that has been um, associated to the involvement of uh, a different part of the, uh, of the uh, brain function, in particular slow wave uh, corresponding to our yellow and green boxes uh, have been associated to an involvement of gray matter uh, fluctuation, uh, whereas a, a high frequency wave corresponding to the light blue um, box in the, uh, this figure has been associated to the white matter fiber activity. We also tested for possible association of these uh, significant differences between patient and uh, ethy control to, with the severity of some symptoms or some uh, dimension of the psychological characteristic of patient. And interestingly, uh, the five high frequency bands were negatively correlated with the level, the severity of many assessed with the um, this scale, as well as uh, with the anxiety levels. So the higher the power spectrum of this, uh, this low three fourth band, uh, the higher will be the anxiety level and the higher will be the uh, manic level, the severity of mania, basically. At the same time, uh, the fourth frequency band correlate with patient negative effect. So the higher was the amount of slow wave in patient, the lower was the uh, negative uh, attitude of this patient, suggesting lower depressive trait, basically. So the traditional approach to the study of the formal network showed the typical spatial distribution of the network with basically no differences between patient and control. And this is a finding in line with past literature. The default uh, mode network valve analysis, however, revealed a different spectral amplitude in ethic control and bipolar samples that, was in, that were inversely associated with patient symptoms uh, severity with anxiety level and pessimistic attitude. In conclusion, uh, the five analysis could complement the full moon network uh, conventional analysis, offering an innovative uh, view, particularly suited to the study of invalidating psychiatric disease. The one that represents challenge, the one in which patients are not uh, um, uh, collaborative to uh, carry out to execute task uh, and carry out uh, a whole experimental setting. Mm. Finally, this study would not be possible without the help of uh, Dr. Romain, Professor Angrelli from the Department of General Psychology, University of Padova, Professor Favaro Magnolfi and Dr. Padova from the Psychiatric Clinic of Padova University Hospital for data collection and patient enrollment and testing as well as uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Marino and Professor Mantini from the uh, Catholic University of Leuven for the data analysis. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Chiara, for uh, uh, finishing in such a great way the, this presentation of this symposium. Um, I'm very glad that uh, you could all uh, share this cutting edge um, knowledge in such a clear way. So I hope also the people that uh, yeah follow, watch the, the symposium enjoyed in the same way I did. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, so there will be a question and answer session. So uh, it would have been great to do it live, let's say, uh, but yeah, of course, these are the limitations linked to the, uh, the current uh, situation, but still uh, it's good to continue with this kind of format with conferences. So uh, you can discuss with us uh, at this session on uh, uh, Thursday, the 9th of September.
So I would like to thank for the very last time Enrico, Camillo, Giorgio, Jessica and Chiara. Thanks a lot really for accepting this invitation and for uh, yeah, bringing uh, yeah, all your uh, knowledge. I'm very glad for it. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot and thanks to everyone for, uh, uh, for your attention.